remember, I think I was about nine. I think that's what it was. And it was a lot longer than 22 steps, let me tell you. Okay, so I have a question. And those of you who stood up that were 18 and under, I want you guys to answer this. What's the theme of the rally? Bear each other's burdens? Kind of. Kind of. Close. In this way, you will. Actually, that was pretty much what it was. <laughs> You're right. Hold on. Sorry, I'm not used to having these things on my ears, so it's, it feels kind of weird. There we go. Can you still hear me? Okay. So in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And it's talking about bearing one another's burdens. And when I was thinking about my sermon, I was asking myself the question, okay, so this is a youth rally, and I'm going to be preaching to youth. And I thought, what type of burdens does a young person have? Chores. <laughs> I'll have to write that down. Okay. Okay, good. You're answering my questions. I thought about it, and I was like, you know what? Young people do actually have burdens. Is that true? Do you guys have burdens? You guys have things that you go through. You guys have things that you need help getting through. And the theme of our rally, and one thing that we're going to focus on, is bearing one another's burdens, is helping each other with your burdens. Now, if you think about this with me, I'm going to ask you guys a question, and you don't have to answer it. I just want you to think about it. How can you help someone else bear their burden? Actually, and I don't even want you to answer. I just want you to think about it. How can you help someone else bear their burden? I want to take a look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 13. At your age and in your time of life, you guys admitted that you did have burdens. You have burdens that, and I'm going to take a guess here, you guys want other people to help you bear your burdens, help you along, help you find the right road, help you walk on the right path. The question I want us to focus on is, in thinking of that, how do we help other people bear their burdens? And the Bible actually gives us the answer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul starts by saying, he says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now there's something I have to explain before we keep reading. Back in that time, when the Holy Spirit worked through men, they actually spoke in tongues. And what that means is, is that I'm speaking English, and the Holy Spirit would help me, and I'm sitting here preaching to you guys, and then I can start speaking in like French to you guys. Wouldn't that be cool? I think that'd be neat. And if there's someone here who can speak French, they can help me understand, or I can help them understand the wonders and the miraculous gifts of God and who God is. That's what it was for. They also had prophecy back then. They had many things that they can do back then. And Paul's saying, if I had that gift of speaking in tongues where I can be up here, I'm preaching to you, and someone can understand me because they speak a different language, and then I can speak to them in their language, and so on and so forth, but I don't have any love, it's worthless. He goes on to say, in verse 2, he says, If I have the gift of prophecy, and know all mysteries, and all knowledge, if I have all faith as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Have you guys ever tried moving a mountain? You have tried moving a mountain? Did it work? <laughs> How many of you guys understand all mysteries? How many of you guys know everything? Oh, hold on, let me ask a question. How many of us think we know everything? 
<laughs> I saw your hand. <laughs> Paul is saying, if I have all knowledge, if I can understand all mysteries, if I have all the faith as to move mountains, but I don't have love, it amounts to nothing. Can you imagine? If we think someone knows a lot of stuff, we're like, wow, that person's really smart, and we hold them in high esteem. If we saw someone move a mountain, we'd be like, whoa, this person must be really godly, and we'd hold them in high esteem. But he, he, says, he says, if I do all those things, but I don't love, it all amounts to nothing. He goes on to say, he says in verse 3, And if I give all of my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. How many of you guys ever got burned before? Does your skin all bubble up and then you have that scab that you have to peel off and it leaves a little scar right there? Yeah. yeah, and it doesn't feel good, does it? He says, if I surrender my body to be burned but don't have love, it profits me nothing. We're talking about bearing one another's burdens. And I believe we can see the need of, hey, this person's in trouble. This person's struggling through something. This person needs help help. How am I supposed to help them? And one thing I'm going to focus on today is that, as it says in the passage, if we do a lot of great things for somebody without love, in the end, it's going to profit, in reality, nothing. Nothing. So let, let me ask you a question. What is love? Okay. Okay. Caring for others? Above yourself. Above yourself. Good. Okay. God. Good. Okay. That would be an act of love. If you look in verse 4, and we're going to look at this really quickly because I don't want to focus on this particular point for too long. It says in verse 4, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, it does not brag, and it is not arrogant. It is, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked, it does not take into account a wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, it hopes all things, and endures all things. Are we patient sometimes? Let me ask you a question, actually. Are we patient all the time? <laughs> We're not patient all the time. I'm not even patient all the time. Are we kind all the time? Are we not rude all the time? Are there times where we're rude? Some of you look really guilty right now. <laughs> look at this list where it says love is patient love is kind love is not jealous love does not brag it is not arrogant let me ask you a question actually i'm going to hold that question until later i'm going to hold that question until later let's turn to romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12. This is what we're going to focus on for my sermon today. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 9. Romans 12 and verse 9. It says, Let love be without hypocrisy. And I'm actually going to stop right there. Let love be without hypocrisy. Do you guys know what hypocrisy means? That's a good form of it. Hypocrisy. What does it mean? You set higher standards for other people than yourself. And you don't follow them yourself? Okay, that's a good definition. When we looked at the word love, it says love is patient. 
Love is kind. And it explained what love was. This verse is saying, let love be without hypocrisy. So in order to illustrate this, because I want you guys to understand this, I need two volunteers. <laughs> Perfect. Come here, Brandon and Anthony. <laughs> okay, so say that both Brandon and Anthony had a problem, a problem that they needed help with. And I like Anthony, but um, Brandon, <laughs> yeah, we have problems there. So I have the ability to help Brandon and Anthony with both of their problems. And I sit here and I tell all you guys, ooh, I, I'm really good at loving people. I love them both, oh well, him, very deeply. I do. And so I come over and I take Anthony and I help Anthony with his problem. Brandon has the exact same problem. And Anthony tells me, hey, you've helped me. Now can you help my brother? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem, because I love this little guy over here. We're just best buddies and I'm going to go be kind and patient and loving with him. <laughs> you see why we don't get along? <laughs> when you think of hypocrisy, and it says, let love be without hypocrisy, the word hypocrisy means putting a face on. It means putting on an act. It's like you put a thought of an actor on a stage during a play. If I'm going to act in a play, I'm going to step on stage, and I'm going to be someone else for a little while, but it's not real. It's not sincere. And I might love Anthony and help him sincerely with his problem. But then when it comes to Brandon, I'm just like, well, I'm going to pretend to like this guy and just get him through his problem so I can get him away from me. Is that the way God wants us to help others and to love others and to bear one another's burdens? You guys can sit down. Thank you. We still have problems. <laughs> I want to focus in on this verse and the verses after these, the verse I just read because I want us to understand what it really means to bear one another's burdens. I don't want us to sit here and listen and be like, okay, yeah, that was a good sermon, that was a fun rally, and then go home and not really know what was preached or not really know about the topic that we talked about. So focus on this. If you want to help someone bear their burdens, if you want to help someone get along, then you have to truly love them without hypocrisy. Think about this. We don't mind loving our friends. We don't lo mind loving our family, some of them. We don't mind loving certain people. But when it comes to those people that we just can't get along with, we just don't like that much, we just really don't want anything to do with them, how well do we love? Wouldn't it be kind of hypocritical to say, we love, we love, we love these certain people over here, but when it comes to bearing the burdens of these people over here, <clears throat> someone else can help them. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you were over here. <laughs> Don't be offended. <laughs> Let's keep going. Romans chapter 9, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. It says, Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. I want to ask you a question. Why should we help one another with our burdens? Why should we? And you can answer. Actually, I want you to answer. Why should we? Is that the reason? That's why we should help someone else is because God wants us to? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other reasons? Okay. Okay. I want you to think about this. Think about who God is and what God has done for us. Are we perfect people? Are we the most lovable 
kids around? Not really. Are we people who God should love? So how can we look at someone else and say, God loved me. God wants me to be helped. God wants me to be his child. God wants me to be his son or daughter in him. But uh, this person over here, I'm not willing to help. I'm not willing to help along. How can we say that? How can we do that? And then call ourselves Christians. Does it work? Do you think God wants us to do that? Or that God would be pleased with us if we live our lives like that? This verse coming up in verse 9, the end part of verse 9, it says, Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. If you want to help someone bear their burdens, this verse is really important. That word abhor, it actually means to shudder. Let me ask you something. What's a food that you hate? Peas, asparagus, raisins. There are some certain vegetables that I just don't like. And so sometimes there'll be a plate of food and it's handed to me and you just look at it and you're like, oh. Do you guys know what chitlins are? No? It's gross. It's a type of food though that people eat. It doesn't smell the best. It doesn't taste the best, in my opinion. This is just my opinion. So every time I'm around chitlins, you smell the smell, you see it, and you're like, oh. <laughs> that same word is the same as abhorring evil. When something evil comes around, we're not supposed to be curious and see what it's about. So we kind of step over and look at it and see what it's all about. When something evil comes about, you're supposed to abhor it. You're supposed to give it that same disgust. Like, ugh, I don't want anything to do with that. Let me ask you a question. If someone your age is struggling with something and you want to help them out, the Bible says abhor what is evil, and it says cling to what is good. And it's our job to help them learn what it means to abhor what is evil, but cling to what is good. I went hiking one time at night, actually, up in Colorado, and I went with a big group of people. And there's this rock, and it really didn't look that big, but I was on this side of the rock, and everyone else was on this side of the rock, and there was kind of like a drop-off, and then this rock. And I thought, okay, I want to get to this side where everyone else is. So instead of going all the way around, because this is going to take so much time, I'm just going to scale this rock across to get to the other side. Brilliant, right? At night when you can't see anything. So I start scaling this rock, and you're literally gripping the rock trying to climb over, and you're facing like this, trying to climb like this. And I get to the middle. Of course, it always has to be the middle. And I realize... You can't scale this rock to the other side because there's no handholds, there's no footholds, there's no way to move. So I'm like, okay, I'll go back. So I look over and I realize you can't get back either. So here I am at night holding on to this rock, clinging to it because I did not want to let go, wondering what in the world I'm going to do. So I had a brilliant idea. Well, I can just jump down. So I look down. And far, far down, you can't see anything because obviously it's night. You can't tell if there's ground or rock or trees or anything. It's just black. So it's like, well, I could jump and see if I can <laughs> hit ground <laughs> or I can try to get back. I'm sitting here trying to make this decision, but my fingers and as best as I could with my feet were clinging to this rock. And of course, I wasn't going to call people to help me because that's embarrassing and you just don't do that. You'd rather jump. <laughs> but I think of this word cling, where you're holding on for dear life 
and you're trying to figure out what to do. You're trying to get your fingers from stop sweating. You're trying to imagine what it would be like to jump and hopefully the ground is close by and you're clinging for dear life. That's what this verse means. Abhor what is evil, but cling to what is good. Hold on to what is good for dear life and don't let it go. Eventually, obviously, I got off the rock. (laughs) I did not jump. I just kind of very slowly got back over to the other side. It was not smart. I would not recommend it. I had my mature moment before I turned 25, Doug. (laughs) I want you guys to think about something for a minute. You guys, actually, everyone 18 and under, stand up again. I want to see who everyone is. Look around. Do you guys think that the other youth standing up have burdens? Maybe? Yes? Do you think that you can be a person that can help someone else who is standing up with their burdens? You can sit down. And if you want to help someone else with their burdens, you want to do it the right way, the way that's actually going to help someone. You know, I was thinking the other day, and I was actually preaching this in one of my sermons. We were talking about teaching and helping others. And I was thinking about this, and I was like, you know what? What would it be like if someone wanted to learn how to play the piano? And I say, okay, I can teach you how to play the piano. I'm really not sure how to play the piano, but I can teach you how to play the piano. So I get one of you, and I say, this is what you do. You come over here, and you sit down, and this is the piano. And uh, these things are the buttons that you push to get the sound out. And this right here is what, you know, what everyone else looks at when they play the piano. So you need this. And... Um, These little black and white dots, those are important because they help you play. And what you need to do is just look at this and push those and you'll play the piano. There. (laughs) Who's going to learn how to play the piano? Um, Well, I should put that word in there. Who's going to learn how to play the piano well? Nobody. When we think about bearing one another's burdens, can we say, okay, this is what you do. This is how you get through. This is the road you are to take. This is what you are to understand. If we're at a spot in our lives where we actually don't even know the road to take or where to go or what to do. This passage right here in Romans 12 It explains what to do to help bear someone's burdens. It says you have to love them without hypocrisy. You have to hate, abhor what is evil, but you have to cling to what is good. If you keep looking at it, it goes on to say that you have to be devoted to one another in brotherly love and give preference to one another in honor. Let me ask you something. How many of you guys have ever climbed a rope before? In some of the school gyms, they have this tall, tall, tall rope. How many of you guys ever climbed something like that before to reach the top? Do they have those anymore? Actually, I didn't see one in that gym. Hmm, must be a Kansas thing. (laughs) And what they'd have in school gyms is that they would have this long rope that reaches up to the ceiling, and you would have to climb it. It was part of the gym exercise or anything like that. Can you imagine helping someone climb that rope halfway, and then you're like, okay, I'm not going to help you anymore, and you leave them alone and leave them hanging there. And they don't know how to get up or get down, and they're stuck there. This verse says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. If you're going to help someone, be devoted to them. Stay with them. Don't just start off and say, I'm going to help you. I'm going to lead you through, and then halfway, leave them be and let them alone. Because it happens. It happens. They start to grow a little bit, 
and then we get distracted by something else, and next thing you know, they're in a spot where they're just hanging on, and they don't know where else to go. It happens. It also says, give preference to one another in honor. That actually means putting someone else above yourself. That means giving someone else the best position, the best of this, the best of that, and you take second best. We think about that and we're like, okay, I could probably do that. But then when it comes to actually doing it, do we actually do it? It goes on to say, in verse 11, it says, Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging behind. Let me ask you something. How many of you guys, when you wake up in the morning, just jump out of bed? Actually, I should put my hand down because it's not me. Two of you? So you wake up and you're just like, oh, it's morning, and you get out of bed and you're in a good mood. <sighs> my dad said that he's a morning person, and so when the alarm goes off, he gets off and he's ready to go. I'm a night person to where, you know, I can stay up late, no problem, but when it's time to get up, my alarm goes off, and I silence that one because I have to set about four because I know I'm going to sleep through and so I wait for the next one, and that one goes off, and then I silence that one. Then I wait for the next one, and that one goes off, and by this time, my wife is furious. <laughs> this idea of fervent in spirit, fervent, it's not lagging behind. It's not what you think of when you get out of bed and you're dragging and just how to start the day and get dressed and go somewhere. Think of like springing up. You're ready to go. You're ready. You're excited. You have this excited zeal to help someone. It's not when someone comes up to you and says, hey, can you, can you help me with this? I'm really having trouble with this. And Austin's sitting here going, oh, fine, I can help. Let me just help you with your problem. Would that work? Not really. But if someone's like, sure, I'd be glad to help. Let me show you what to do. Let me bear your burden. Let me be willing to help you get through this. That's what works. It goes on to say, in verse 12 it says, Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Let me tell you something. When it says persevering in tribulation, that gives me the idea that sometimes bearing one another's burdens isn't always easy. It isn't always simple. It's not something that you can just be like, ooh, this was a piece of cake. It's not like that all the time. Sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes it stresses you out. Sometimes it puts you in a position where you're hurting. It says persevere in tribulation. In that next part, it says, be devoted to prayer. Let me ask you a question. How often do you guys pray for one another? Because if you think about it, we say that a lot, and you hear it all the time. Well, good luck. I'll be praying for you. Oh, you're going through something? I'll be praying for you. Oh, okay. Well, I'll be praying for you. Oh, I'm sorry you're going through that. I'll be praying for you. I hope you feel better. I'll be praying for you. We say it all the time, but do we actually do it? In verse 13, and this is the last verse we're going to look at, it says, contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing hospitality. Now, I would strongly advise you guys to ask your parents first before you invite someone over to your house and say, hey, come stay with us. Eat our food for however long that you want. Let me help you. Ask your parents first. But sometimes someone needs to stay and stay in your room and sleep in your bed, how, uh, how willing are we when that has to happen and we have to sleep on the couch or somewhere else? <laughs> I want you guys to look at these verses from chapter 9, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. And I want you to think about this thought. When we talk about bearing one another's burdens, we're talking about physically, yes, helping them with something physical, yes, but also something spiritual, 
also something where someone is having a hard time getting through. Someone is struggling with something. Someone just can't move forward. And you are strong enough to help them through. You're strong enough to get this person back to where they need to be with God. You're strong enough to encourage this person that they can get back to God. You're strong enough to help this person even get to God if they've never known God before. You're willing to help bear that burden. You know, I think about this, and I think so many times we, as young people, we hear a sermon, and we say, that was a good sermon. That was great. I should probably do that. And then when the opportunity arises, it's just not as easy as we think it's going to be. I'm going to remember what it was like to be 18 and younger. And I know it's not as easy as it seems. I know that from 18 and younger, you go through a lot of burdens yourselves. And even the thought of helping someone else with their burdens seems impossible because you're busy with your own burdens. I remember what it's like sometimes feeling like you're the only one who has burdens and everyone else, they're just making it through just fine. And you're the only one with the problems. So it'd be embarrassing. It would be humiliating. It would be unthinkable to let someone else know that you have burdens. This is kind of what this verse is talking about. Because in reality, Everyone has burdens past the age of 18. We're talking about helping one another with those burdens. Because guys, I can tell you right now, and some of you I don't even know very well, that you guys have burdens. I can just tell you that from experience. And if we can help each other, even at this age, help each other with our burdens, it would be neat to see each and every one of you in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s. Hopefully I'm still alive then. To see you guys in the same position that you are like, whoa, there's Darren. I remember when you were like, how old are you? 14. <laughs> I remember when you were 14 and you sat in the second pew at the rally in Butler and now you're like 50 and you have a wife and kids of your own. It's great to see you here. And oh look, you're still sitting next to Zeke. Boy, that friendship is still strong and bubbling over there. And you guys, you guys have grown up and it's great to see you. It's great to see your kids. It's great to see you guys still in the church, still serving God, still, still bearing one another's burdens. That would be awesome. But I don't want you to think that you have to wait until you're 20, 30, 40 to start doing this. You guys can do it right now. And if you start right now, when you're 20, 30, 40, or 50, I'm not going to say it would get easier, but you'll be stronger and it'll be worth it. And I want you to think of something as we close. Can you imagine being in heaven and you look over and you see the same people sitting here? Well, you see them in heaven you see the same people that are sitting around you today. Wouldn't that be awesome? And it, wouldn't it be cool if you can have that thought of, you know what? We helped each other get here. We helped each other make it. I think that'd be cool. I'm going to turn things back over to Sam.